Few images convey nature's wholesomeness so well as that of a babbling mountain stream. At each stone, the water whirls and draws in air. The water breathes. In the spiraling of water, the Austrian natural scientist Victor Schauberger recognized a basic form of movement in nature. His aim was to imitate the spinning movement in technical devices and thus produce naturally inclined, environmentally friendly energy. Schauberger developed revolutionary propulsion units with which, for example, aeroplanes are not pushed but drawn forward. Victor's son, Walter Schauberger, searched for a mathematical formula to explain his father's findings. He designed a funnel based on the hyperbolic spiral in which the stream of falling water formed a dramatic spiral pattern. Seen from above, it looks like a spiral nebula in space. Further down in the hyperbolic Schauberger funnel, the pulsating double helix reminds us of the DNA spiral. A coincidence? The turbulence creates a stable pulsating structure out of swirling chaos. A pattern of natural self-organization there for us to understand and then copy in Victor Schauberger's view. Faithful to the silent forests was the maxim of his ancestors. Victor Schauberger was born on the 30th of June, 1885, son of a forest superintendent. The house where he was born in Holzla, in the Mühlviertel region of Upper Austria. Victor attended forestry school and graduated in 1904. In remote districts, Victor could observe the woods in all peace, areas as yet untouched by humans. His observations over many years in this natural environment crucially shaped his later life's work. From early on, the forester turned his attention to the mountain streams and to the trout in them. Victor Schauberger recognized that the fish do not only swim against the stream, but that the water itself can flow in opposite directions. He himself started to go against the tide of current doctrine. Simple forester that he was, Victor, here with his wife Maria and son Walter, was soon to astonish the scholars. The border between Austria and the Czech Republic runs not far from the house where he was born on the edge of the Burma Wald Gud. Over many kilometers, the Schwarzenberger Schwemmkanal marks the national border. In Victor's youth, wood was transported down this stream to the Danube, where it was loaded onto ships. However, the channel could not carry entire tree trunks, but only logs. Victor Schauberger was to become well known for his logging flumes with a much greater carrying capacity. This small pond is what remains of a storage lake. A few years ago, it was still full of water, Lake Taschel. And 80 years ago, innumerable felled trunks floated in it, especially in the spring. In 1929, a documentary was filmed here. The forester Schauberger used his knowledge of the powers inherent in water to build a modern logging flume in the Mertz Valley in Green Styria. A 
approaching the weir from the valley. Beneath the intake gate, a steep chute accelerates the departing timber. In man-made channels, heavy trunks floated down to the valley, even logs heavier than water. How was this possible? The first intermediate dam is reached. Due to the fact that cold water carries better than warm, the water that's been warmed up by sunlight, velocity and frictional force along the way has to be replaced by new cold water. Today there are only ruins left from the intermediate dam. But Victor Schauberger became well known for his logging flumes far beyond the Austrian borders. Similar log chutes were built to his designs in former Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. It is not documented whether this man with the flowing beard is actually Victor. Final destination, the sorting plant in Neuburg on the Murz, another little marvel. The big trunks slide over a drop and the smaller ones fall through. The lumber plant at Neuberg on the Murz is going to be partly rebuilt for demonstration purposes. This is worthwhile because, as a construction for water regulation, it was unique in the world. In the only sound document of Victor Schauberger's from the year 1955, he explains the most important underlying principle. Man erreicht den Manumanitzustand, die, die höchste Dichte, die größte äh, Schleppkraft. Das Wasser fand zum Ziehen an und damit habe ich das erreicht, was ich beim Schwämmen habe wollen. But what did Victor mean by moving in a certain way? His grandson Jörg Schauberger offers further details. These logging flumes all meandered down to the valley. There were further structures along the way which swirled the water within the channels. This enabled the water to carry even heavier loads. Many people have tried to build similar structures, but my grandfather's logging flumes were the only ones that really worked. Victor Schauberger received many patents for aspects of his logging flumes, as well as for natural watercourse regulation devices. and for the guide vanes that divert the water into the middle of the river, preventing damage to the banks. In the Pythagoras Kepler School in Bad Ischl, Victor's grandson Jörg and his wife Ingrid have held numerous courses and workshops on the topic The Nature and Movement of Water. <laughs> In his own way, Victor Schauberger analyzed the meandering movement of a natural watercourse and described it in detailed drawings. His conclusions are valid for all rivers. However, Victor's unorthodox proposals for regulation of the Rhine and Danube were ignored by the experts. Even on a smooth window pane, water doesn't flow straight down but starts to meander. A pulsating space curve develops. According to Schauberger, a river doesn't just flow, but winds itself forward. A river rotates in its bed. Put simply, it swirls. In the bends, the current is fiercest, ripping up and grinding the boulders in its bed. In Victor's words, the river chews up its stones. The minerals contained in them are food for the water. When the turbulence diminishes, the sediments slowly settle down again. Where the river deposits the most, a ford is formed. Now the river starts to curve the other way round and accelerates its space curve until the next opposite bend appears. Victor Schauberger called this alternation between the left and right hand curves with fords in between a curve or river generator. Yeah. 
The Swedish engineer Olaf Alexanderson, now 90 years old, published the first book about Victor Schauberger in the 1970s. He is still investigating the river generator. And then I said to myself, if a charge is built up here, then maybe it can be measured with an ammeter. And then I inserted a copper plate here, which was firmly soldered to a cable, and here another plate. I used a copper cable about 10 meters long. I got a registration. Here I had a pulsating direct current. It was a generator. I also measured in a straight stream. And there it was very bad. It was like a dead river. There were long stretches that had no charge at all. According to Schauberger, temperature variations are crucial for the energy processes in a watercourse. Even the slightest differences in temperature cause the different layers in the water to flow faster or slower. The water rubs against itself, bringing about ripples and vortices. A positive consequence is that the river slows itself down. In 1930, the Austrian Academy of Sciences confirmed the receipt of a sealed envelope entitled Turbulence. In it, Schauberger described his theory about the interdependence of water temperature and movement. The Academy kept the document under seal for 50 years. A confession that the time was not yet ripe for unlettered Schauberger and his practical perceptions from nature. Thanks to the distinguished work of the Styrian hydraulic engineer Ottmar Grober, this has since changed. Here we have a river bank that was protected massively against floods. But Viktor Schauberger said one regulates a river through itself from its center. Normally, hydraulic engineers shore up the riverbanks with stones. Grober does it differently and, incidentally, more cost-effectively. He places the boulders in a river, like here in the Salza. The stones are deposited to form a chute. And then Grober had the idea of building an even larger chute in the longest river in Styria, the Moor. The rocks, each weighing a couple of tons, are mechanically placed into the riverbed at low water. Gorber is a professional and monitors the position of the rocks with a GPS. The rocks have to be accurately placed if the chute is going to fulfill its purpose of drawing the water away from the banks to the center of the stream. This chute was designed and built with unconventional methods in that it is the first scheme to be built from the inside out to direct the energy from the banks towards the middle. That means that I don't have to destroy or disturb the banks at all, as all of the work is done in the river itself. Building the channel not only stabilizes the banks, but also improves the water quality. Robert doesn't see himself as a river manager, but rather as a river liberator. His chute accelerates the water in the middle of the stream. The riverbed is then eroded by the increased flow velocity in the middle. And this again results in uneven depths in the middle of the river. And so the large hoochen, also called the Danube salmon, which live here, are able to find a habitat that corresponds to the needs of their species. That means different water depths with different flow velocities. At normal water levels, the boulders are no longer visible. The funnel-shaped current, though, is recognizable. At low water, the channel becomes clearly visible. Shortly after the construction, Gorba had the current measured with a hydrometric vane apparatus. 
Further measurements were taken by Graz University of Technology.